All right. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with the Doctors. We are back. What's up, my brother? What's up, Eric? Everything is good. Um, you know, enjoying the warm weather here in Connecticut this time of the year. So oh, <laughs> I'm I'm jealous. It's cl- it's cloudy and overcast right about oh, now. Wow. Yeah, it's been nice here. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, for those of you who don't know, and many of you out there may not, uh, Dr. Walsh and I were in the same building at the same time within the past month. And that was <laughs> he he did what he did, which is just kind of throw down and had everyone in awe and breaking down food addiction. That was good. We're going to have to bring that to the audience here. Yeah, sure. we do have to do that. You were phenomenal as well. Um, we were two of only like six or seven speakers that day at that conference and it, it was overall just an amazing conference quite frankly um it was nice to see the passion of people around lifestyle as a um, health solution um and to see the organization we, that that put it on to see such a large organization wanting that to happen i thought was really exciting as well yeah yeah no it, it for sure i mean and to, to think about all physicians so what that means just the reach and the touch with, with each of those providers being able to give back to their patients, to the nurses, to the staff. I mean, I think that's what is incredible in terms of this shift that we're starting to see, this right. seismic shift. People are starting to understand and get back to the basics, the power of lifestyle. So it's good stuff. It's good stuff. I agree. All right, let's get into this. So we yeah. are doing, this is Mental Health um, Awareness Month. And um, this is dear to my heart. I have seen a lot in my own family of mental health issues, um, yes. everything from severe anxiety. I was talking to some family members this past weekend. I went to Miami for a funeral and to speak for a graduation. Somehow, many of my own family talking about the severe anxiety and at times depression they've had, some of their kids have had. Um, we've had schizophrenia in our family. Yes. We've had a suicide in our family of a 13 year old, beautiful young lady. Um, uh, and then recently, you know, two of our dear friends, um, two separate sets of parents, have lost their children to suicide. And I could tell you over the last six years, I know several families that have suffered from from that um, devastation. So we we present what we present today, um, really just to look at this and to hopefully inspire people to um, do take the steps they need to take to to have uh, adequate, proper mental health support, awareness, and and if needed, treatment. Yeah. No, you know, thanks for doing that intro for this. It's it's such an important topic. And I think one of the things, even though we aren't it's off the cuff, we have to silence the shame. Right. We have to kind of eliminate this idea of mental health carries with it so much luggage and baggage of of just guilt from those who are left surviving. There's a, a matter of shame of those who are suffering with it. And we have to understand that this is actually a disease state. This is an imbalance that's there that needs to be addressed. And there's multiple things that can play a role with it. And we're going to talk about some of those here today. Um, but we have to understand that it's important and it, it deserves care just like if you were a diabetic. It deserves care just like you were coming in with an acute Absolutely. heart attack on a regular basis. So I think this is an important month. May is an important month for this reason to make us all take a step back and realize this. So... Yeah, I mean, I think one of the first things here kind of starting off is that this is nothing new. And what's crazy is I was kind of looking at different stuff. I circled it. 1931. 1931. Mm-hmm. Mental health is as a national problem. This was published inside mm-hmm. Journal of American Medical Association. This is before my dad was born. December 19th of 1932 that they we recognize this. This is nothing new. It's been persistent this whole time. And it's ebbed and flowed. And I think the issue is, is that we may have we're 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 receiving information at a much faster pace in terms of the devastation with it and the information the world's smaller. And they had come out of at that time. They were just coming out of the Great Depression, Mm -hmm. um, a financial depression. But you can only imagine what the poor nutrition, increased poverty. um, They had suffered the ravages of the First World War about 13 years earlier, um, and they didn't know they were about to head into a second one. Um, But, you know, there was a lot of mental health problems then. But I would argue the world is far more complex today. The influence on people for poor mental health is even greater. This was during the time of the Prohibition, March 28, 1931. Prohibition Mm -hmm. started, I think, 1920, ended 1933. So alcohol was not flowing like it does today, um, which is one of the things people actually try to use as a coping mechanism. So it's a very interesting 
a point that is made that it is not anything new. So that, that's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. And there is. And so it's widespread. You know, I mean, this is a global phenomenon. It's not just a U.S. specific type of a scenario here as the world is very short. You go on social media and what you see, you see people from Europe, from Australia, from Africa. Mm -hmm. The world is very small right now. We see that this mental health issue is just continuing to increase. This, this quote here states 13 percent rise in conditions and substance use disorders, which really ties into what we always say. What stress equals demands minus resources and really that tapping into fake resources mm -hmm. to alleviate these stressors of life is what's happening. And those false resources actually compound the problem. Alcohol, drugs or other addictive behaviors can actually, you know, the only, you know, the problem is still going to be there at the end, but that's right. you gambled away all of your money. You got, now you got the problem and you broke. Uh, so <laughs> that's right. You know, that's, that's the challenge. Yeah, and it is. And, and it, it affects, I mean, this is something I think we've always known to some degree in terms of like in, in our more mature, I, I, I like to call the patients coming in to see me, not elderly, not old, but more mature <laughs> is what I tell them. And so our, our more mature adults with depression, and mental health issues, they're actually, these studies kind of reflect on them actually aging faster than their peers and having poor uh, cardiovascular as well as overall brain health when they're in this situation. And this makes sense based on what we've presented before around stress, right? On depression yes. as a, you know, as a manifest, on one hand, as a manifestation of stress, another one, on another way, it is um, kind of um, uh, works synergistically with stress. Um, and this means that the cortisol, the adrenaline, all those hormones we've talked about before are going to have even more devastating effects on the body. Um, depression and anxiety kind of can go hand in hand. But hormonally, you know, a lot of the damage is at the cellular level. It isn't going to look very different um, from the physical standpoint. And I think that's what this is showing. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. You know, this one is really kind of transitioning from our, our, our elderly population over to our young, our youth really our, our future. And, and this basically kind of notes that our, in our children and our young adults, the emergency room visits have increased exponentially for mental health reasons. So actually not the, the emergency room visits themselves, but the percent of visits due to mental health disorders has really increased. It's doubled, uh, including a five-fold increase in the proportion of visits for suicide-related symptoms. This 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 idea that that person has to end it all, that there's they're hopeless, that there's a lack of hope in this world. And that's really concerning. The fact of how are we providing coping skills to our children? Yeah. And, and I don't know. You know, I think the world has become it, it, there's there's a there's a great book. It was laying around on my desk as I hold <laughs> it up. Uh, just read Grit. Um mm. And um, I'll probably put it back in my cabinet, but it's a phenomenal book um, that speaks to, you know, the fact that we think talent is what gets people where they are in life. And it's actually grit. It's that resolve to never give up. Yeah. You kind of saw that on display last night. I saw that in LeBron James, even as the Lakers lost that series. Come on, man. Now, why are you going to bring that up right now? Why are you going to bring that up? <laughs> it makes the point that he, did, he never laid down. You nah. know, he had grit. If, if, if you had two people on the team with the grit he had, they'd have Tell won that game it. last night. Um, and grit is different than, than um, you know, just pure raw talent. Yeah. So there, you worry, based on things that are going on in society today, are we raising young people without grit, mm -hmm. uh, as the book talks to, people without resolve? And so they're very easily influenced by what other people think. Um, if things get too difficult, they think they're the failure and they give up. Um and this fivefold increase in the proportion of visits for suicide-related symptoms, I have seen in my own practice. You guys know I, I work urgent care, which is kind of like um, a hybrid between primary care and, and emergency rooms. And, and I, I run, I'm the medical director for many clinics, about 26 of them now. And um, this is a common thing. I mean, we see young people coming. We, we, you know, we even have a behavioral health component now, not to deal with the more acute mental health issues, but because chronically this is just kind of like sitting on young people. Yeah. Um, and it leads to suicidal ideation. We talked about that at the beginning in the intro. This is a serious problem. Parents need to be talking to their kids um, to make sure that they're okay um, and not be afraid of things like therapy, as we'll talk about towards the end. Absolutely. You know, I, 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 I can't let this go about the basketball analogy because I was watching a clip of Kobe Bryant. And so full disclosure, it's going to don't kill me as a Laker fan. I wasn't a Kobe lover. 
when he played with the Lakers, not until he retired. And then I had mad respect for his his hustle, his work ethic, and what he was about. You know, and one of the things he talked about inside this little segment I watched recently was about failure. And he was like, I don't believe in failure. And he talked about really it's just a matter of learning from an event. And who cares? You're going to wake up the next day and keep going on. And that really reflects what you're talking about, about that grit, that persistence, and the understanding that I'm going to mount a challenge response as opposed to a threat response to adversity. And understanding that, yes, I have the resources and just because I stumble doesn't mean I don't have the resources to overcome. And I think that's important for all of us, right? That's not just important for our kids. It's important for all of us to really demonstrate that on a regular basis. And the way we say it now is you don't win. It's not win or lose. It's win or learn. That's right. Um, I love it. That's that grit. I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, we need to hashtag that right there. I don't know. I hadn't, you know, it's not about win or lose, win or learn. We're going to hashtag that. You guys hashtag that and send that out as you're watching this. All right. Um, this one, this was really, I, I, I teach at the university level um, part-time, and this is something I discussed today in class. Um, the Surgeon General warns that social media may harm children and adults. Adolescents who spend more than three hours per day on social media may be at a heightened risk for mental health problems, particularly internalizing problems. What does social media really do? Yeah. Obviously, there is bullying. Obviously, there is... Um, you know, negative comments and things that can happen. But inherently, there are some who argue just the uh, just the comparison between the young person and other people, the false lives that you, people set up completely. I see people act like they're travel osos and they're all over the world. You know, they don't they don't really have any money. They might scrape the last dime they have together and buy the cheapest trip to Jamaica, stay in the worst possible resort, and then they're on the beach like they ballerific. <laughs> right. So, you know, you, you compare yourself to what is not real. Yeah. Um, you know, we are seeing in medicine an explosion of plastic surgery, aesthetics. And so we think people are real. People have mastered makeup in a way never before seen lighting. Yes. Um, so you, you're not looking at true reality all the time. Yeah. But kids don't know that kids have a challenge. Some argue in differentiating reality from fantasy sometimes or from make believe. You know, you know, up to a certain age, kids can't even tell the difference between the actual TV program and the commercials, right? They think all of it is the same story, well, not the same storyline, but the same reality line. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is a major problem because social media is only getting more and more. We noticed, we saw recently, actually just this week, Montana is being sued, the state of Montana, for banning TikTok. Mm-hmm. And if you look at some of the stuff on TikTok, and, you know, I'm not a TikTok expert, I don't have TikTok. But I've seen some stuff where they show you what TikTok looks like in China compared to what TikTok looks like in the United States. And TikTok in China is all about nationalism, education, science, family. And in America, it's just foolish dance routines and, you know, promoting alcohol and parties. And it's, you know, it's, it's it, it lies, a lot of misinformation about everything from diseases to, to you know, to, to money and all kinds of things. So, uh, this is a real problem for young people. I advise parents to keep their kids away from this as long as they can. Um, you know, if you don't have to give them a phone, give them a flip phone. Uh, you know, people like, act like they're, they're child going to die if they don't have a smartphone. Give them a flip phone. Um, a lot of kids are actually asking for flip phones now. Social media is so painful to them, and they're so pressured by constantly being exposed to it. There's actually a move among the younger kids now to actually just get a simple flip phone because they don't want the constant pressure. So, Parents take control on this one. This is a serious issue. It is. And I mean, you know, when you look at the fact that it affects adults, where we're seeing glorified images, body types that are impossible to achieve, right? Because they're mastered by by all of the the, the computer software that's out there and, and plastic surgery people are really having. And they're they're struggling and getting all of these things done. What do we think is happening to our next generation? Mm. You know, and so it, it's it's persistent. And, and you're absolutely right. I've seen it with my own kids. I have teenagers and they at times will say, you know what, Dad, I'm taking a, a holiday from this stuff. You know, I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not on it right now. And so I'm appreciative that they have the wherewithal to kind of say, I'm going to put this on pause. You know, as they say, just pause for a moment. And it's it's important. And it's it's a struggle. It's not an easy concept because kids, sometimes it's a feeling of belonging. It's a feeling of everyone else is doing it, that peer pressure and not being on it gives them the, them the impression. So there's so much that comes in. And part of it is trying to have open conversations, 
So I definitely don't want to act like I have all the answers regarding raising kids. I'm still in the process, the throes of it. I'm a few paces behind you, but I think it's trying to have conversation as much as possible plays a substantial role. Absolutely. You know, we look, we look here, it's, it's just, we're, we're seeing these increases as we, as we already mentioned in the mental health diagnoses. And then I think this is really the one you touched on this already that when they looked at this survey and here's the thing, catch this mm. kids, one in three kids between the ages of nine to 13 worry, right? This is kind of the, the, the building blocks for anxiety at least once a week. Now they worry about school, friendships, family members, um, worrying about the way they look, about being bullied, and one in five express worries about safety or violence in the world, which we are seeing at exponentially large rates, right? This is dovetailing into many of the, the tragedies that are occurring around the country from mental health disorders. And our kids are witnessing this on television, on, on social media, and amongst everything else that their kid, they're, they're talking about with their, their friends and, and colleagues. And I want to throw in there that when I do the talk on food addiction, one of the things I bring up is that they're finding that kids are stress eating as young as four years old. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you think about it, they're worrying and their worrying is translating in their early childhood into stress eating. And what do we give them when they stress eat? Yeah. Hyper palatable, addictive food like substances like Twinkies, hot dogs, pizza. Um, and so these kids are, you know, we're, we're, it's a triple whammy because as we're going to talk about nutrition, well, can either help you or actually make it worse if it's bad nutrition. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, just hovering on that for a second. I mean, what do we do? We, we're really part of the problem. We are right. We give kids, we give ourselves these foods when we're sad and we're anxious. These hyper palatable foods. We give it to you when you're uh, celebrating mm -hmm. and when you're ha a good time, you do well in school, you get an A. What do you get? I'm going to get you a treat. You're not feeling well. You're set. I'm going to give you a treat. And then we then we combine all that with social events, with family gatherings that we stoke this emotion of memories that we tie to these foods that now leads people inside this vicious pathway. They don't know which way to turn when you're older. Do I feel good? What do I eat? I feel bad. What do I eat when I'm having a family gathering? What do I eat? It's all the same stuff that leads itself towards disease, mental yeah, and, and physical. And when we when I used to teach the nicotine um, dependence classes, you know, the sort of stop smoking classes at the Veterans Hospital in Loma Linda, I think that was one of the things that shocked me the most as I was as a preventive medicine resident at the time. What shocked me the most is that people don't I thought people smoke cigarettes, you know, to to deal with stress or whatever. But what they would what those veterans told me is that they, if they had something to celebrate, they needed a cigarette just as much as when they had something to to um, you know, to to grieve over. Yeah. Um, in other words, they could, there was no swing in emotion that they could handle without that chemical nicotine. Yeah. And after a while, they were no longer smoking cigarettes to get a buzz or to feel better. They were getting to just feel normal. Yeah. If our kids start stress eating at that young age because of these worries, I mean, look at this is one in five express worries about safety or violence yeah. in the world. I mean, these are ubiquitous themes that are always on the news. If they start eating like that to escape this, what hope does that child have in a world that just doesn't seem like it's getting any better? Yeah. Wow. Wow. It's a lot. It's a lot. I mean, here's the, here's the, and I won't say the most challenging, but here's the thing is you think position, heal yourself. Mm. We're seeing this mm. in it. We're not excluded. So many times the perception is, well, doctors were somehow, we know better. We should do better. We don't have those same issues. I would pose that these issues of health are probably worse with us because out of fear of seeing somehow that you're vulnerable. And this Medscape study, it surveyed over 13,000 physicians in 2021, found that 24% of respondents felt that they had been clinically depressed. Clinically that's, depressed. That's basically one out of four. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, and it, it doesn't start when we were just talking about kind of med school and residency and rounding and all that stuff like that and, and being out in four years. And so depression is common in med profession that this, this is saying what 12% of males, 19.5% of females and medical students, residents with the 15 to 30% of them being screened as positive with depression for depressive symptoms. Listen, I'm sure there's times when I had it. <laughs> yeah, and tell me about it. Tell when you me didn't about think it. something went right, or 
you got a bad attending, or I mean, there's a lot of reasons to get depressed. Listen, <laughs> stress <laughs> equals demands minus resources, right? Exactly. Those demands of med school life, yeah, learning yeah, all that it. stuff. And it wasn't always, a, you know, we didn't, and truthfully, we didn't have the same resources some of my classmates had. Nah. The school. They had, nah. they had all kind of legacy privileges with old tests, and yes. we found out some of them was getting help from from some of the deans, all kind of stuff. Big scandal after the fact. So, listen, I'm gonna tell you how I'm gonna tell you how how uninformed I was. My foolish, naive self thought, well, if I'm looking at an old test, that means I'm cheating. I don't need to cheat. I'm just going to stay from the book. About five, ten books that are this thick. It's, it's just like, okay, you know, learning and understanding. So that creates this unnecessary uh, level of stress that's there. And this demand on you with limited resources of time and of energy and of really capacity at that point. Mm -hmm. so it's 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 something else and and this is what's really troubling i mean this essentially is a reflection of of a male clinic resident who passed away from suicide and this 2019 study kind of it intimated really roughly about 300 doctors die annually from suicide another study came in and was a little bit more critical and said that roughly around 119 either way the estimates show that on average we lose every year between one small and one large medical school class due to suicide, right? Physician suicide, which is, it's horrific. It really truly is. Yeah, we have to, we have to do something. So, I mean, it's, we talk about this all the time, just yeah. like our stress equals demands minus resources, our health, our mental health equals our resiliency divided by our stress and how we add to things. Absolutely. It becomes important. And so we understand chronic disease is resiliency over mental health. The poor are mental health. There's some ties to it. It's connected. It's all connected. That's there. Um, this one was interesting, right? So it looked at chronic conditions, meaning high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, heart disease, all these things like that, that they found that individuals who have depression had increased risk right? And individuals who had depression and anxiety across the, the, the age span and uh, as well as in younger men. And so this was significant, meaning that there is a somewhat of a direct relationship. And so we understand that there's conditions when you're struck with chronic uh, health conditions that a lot of times that can become depressing to individuals. Mm -hmm. And so we call that actually depression due to chronic medical conditions, but also depression itself. I never really thought about it from the concept of depression may somehow expose you, but it makes sense. Your habits of eating, your inactivity, your, your isolation from others. And we know we talked about inside this platform multiple times of how those things are directly related to disease occurrence. Absolutely. So that's, that's one of them. Another one basically looking at the same thing, basically talking about functional impairment, high medical costs, lack of adherence to treatment, increased risk, for other conditions and mortality, uh, basically in, amongst individuals who are depressed and have these comorbid uh, diseases too as well. Yeah, depression makes it hard for you to exercise your grit, your resolve. Yeah. So if you have a chronic condition and you're depressed, um, you know, there's a concept that you kind of can throw in there that, that a, folk can actually suffer from a, what, what I would call like a, like a slow suicide. You're so mm. depressed, you have these diseases and you're not really willing you're not, you're not saying say you're willing. You don't, you still have the desire to try and buff it against these chronic conditions. So you kind of may not be very compliant with the program. You may not really change your lifestyle. You don't have the energy to get up and exercise. Food becomes your best friend, um, bad food especially. And so, you know, depression basically comes as like a um, amplifier on these chronic diseases because in order to beat high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, diabetes, you've got to have some motivation to want to beat them. And depression can take that motivation away. And again, it could be like slow suicide where people start, you know, I've heard patients say like, eh, I got to die from something anyway, doc. Like mm -hmm. it just, eh, whatever kind of happens, happens. And that's a dangerous place to be when you're dealing with some of these diseases because um, it, it's, it's a slow, it's like a roller coaster. It may be very slow getting to the top, but once those, once you turn that point, yeah. that first stroke, that first heart attack, that you know, the first kidney uh, problem failure. I mean, it, it's difficult. You can't take it back. It's like trying to get toothpaste back up into a tube. You yeah. know, those diseases just start to rattle off. So depression really does make things very much worse. 
Um, and you know, the body and the mind are so well connected that you can somaticize some of the so you, you can make the disease worse because you, your mind is telling your body to be sick. So all of that kind of plays in together. Why depression treatment is so important. Yes, yes, and yes, yes. It's it's substantial. You know, quality of life becomes affected. We see, you know, and it, it just it just it makes it hard. It makes it hard to care for member uh, patients like that too, as well, because of trying to really get to the crux of how you can provide therapy, excuse me, appropriate treatment. And so that's why, once again, it is so important to get in with your mental health provider, right? And look at the resources right. and call uh, the hotlines and so forth with NAMI and so forth becomes extremely important. So, you know, one of the things, you know, we've said before, you know, I'm an interventional cardiologist and, and Dr. Walsh is uh, over urgent cares across uh, multiple urgent cares, has his PhD and, and everything else like that. Um, but the question is, why is mental health important to different specialties? And I'll, I'll tell you, I wasn't taught this, just almost like we talk about nutrition. I wasn't really talked about, I wasn't taught really about this role, but what science has really come to bear and has told us repeatedly there is a direct connection between mental health and the heart. And so one of the things that we find and we know is that up to 20% of people with heart disease are going to experience some form of depression. Mm. It makes sense. So I, when I see people when they've suffered with a heart attack, especially men, not just men, women, but I'm going to give men for an example. All of a sudden, there's this fear of, will I ever recover? Will I ever be of use again? Can I go back to, mm. to work? Am I going to be able to recover? Am I going to be able to love my wife the way I loved her before or my spouse the way that I loved them before um, in that, 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 that marital way, right? They're, they're, they're concerned about all those things that are there and it leads, leads them up to depression. But here's the thing is that when you are depressed after having a heart attack, we know that this increases the risk of recurrent heart attacks. That's why it's so important to address it. And that's probably the thing that we as cardiologists are least likely to address during our, our visits with you after a heart attack. That's why getting in to cardiac rehab, I'm going to do a little side commercial, is so important because it gives you an opportunity to learn that, yes, I can be a piece of Tupperware. I can get back out there and be active. I'm not a piece of fine china where this is the 1950s and I need to stay on bed rest for six weeks and never and avoid any form of stress. Um, so this is an important one to me. It's an important one to me that I try to instill inside of uh, the residents who work with me, inside of the nurses who work in the program is really screening for depression and for understanding the role and risk of anxiety and these, these mental health uh, disorders that are there. Absolutely. So multiple aspects that are there. Another one basically kind of talked about individuals who reported being depressed or having mental health, poor mental health days or at higher risk for heart attack strokes and risk factors for heart disease, meaning diabetes and high blood pressure compared to those without mental health issues. So it's important. And we don't give you this stuff to tell you and make you depressed, <laughs> but to tell you that there's hope that you have to seek all uh, therapy and opportunities in order to help you. So I put this on here in terms of with a rheumatologist, mainly for the aspect of, of what's one of the things that bothers people an awful lot of times is arthritis or joints, their back, they're stiff, all these aspects there. And what's interesting about this is talked about the rates of depression, right? The prevalence of depression in individuals with arthritis, this type of rheumatoid arthritis, around nearly 20% from a Lancet psychiatry uh, article. And it shows that the relationship between rheumatoid arthritis and depression is complex, and they speculate pain and fatigue are to blame for causing exacerbating depression, which can affect the quality of life. And, you know, I, I, I talk about in our other lectures about the role of stress and how the body, this cascade through the amygdala impacts the bone marrow that leads to inflammation. And this inflammation then triggers the disruption of the placking. And so there may be a hypothesis that still is yet to be explored about how that same process may affect inflammation inside the joints. And we understand that, that many disease states are inflammatory based and lead to a, a number of issues along with just the inactivity that results. Yeah, the, the stress response to um, cortisol, uh, of cortisol, you know, it can happen in some of these mental health conditions. And cortisol all by itself can help to trigger some of these inflammatory pathways, mess up the immune system. Um, so, yeah, you know, so there, there's, there's something to that. Um, 
information, you know, more we, you know, as we talk, the more we talk about it, information is one of the worst things that can happen to you. Um, and it's sad. It, I mean, if you got to think about it, if you can get some of that information from your mindset and then you turn around and eat, you know, fried foods with all that oil, you get, yeah. you get inflammation from two different sources, probably yeah. two different pathways. And that would make sense why people age so fast and have so many inflammatory uh, based conditions. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, it's, it's obviously we see it in diabetes too as well. And this is one common, right? And so there's multiple reasons for this. It say, suggests diabetes and depression twice as frequent as, uh, uh, as either alone. And this kind of makes sense to me, right? So we understand that diabetes is, is essentially a vascular disease. Yeah. And so we understand that being a vascular disease is going to affect the brain. It's going to affect really the nutrients. It's going to affect the, the hormones. It's going to affect it really in terms of uh, what we call small strokes or lacunar strokes that can change in terms of making one more prone towards forms of dementia uh, as well that can exist there. And so it's it's so important for maintenance of that blood sugar. Uh, you know, one of the, the recent things I've been telling patients is that it's essentially like we're crystallizing our, 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 our organs by having all the blood sugar that's elevated just course through our, our, our vessels is what we're doing because it can't be absorbed. And that's really what a hyperglycemic or diabetic state is, is that your inability to, to, to metabolize the blood glucose effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is one of the last ones that we have here in this sequence here. And this one kind of just basically kind of reemphasizes the fact that the, the combination of these, these conditions of diabetes, which is the bane of my existence. Like, I, I, that's one of the worst diseases ever, really, is diabetes. And, and it's something that increases in trajectory as we get older. So it's so important that we're paying attention to it and that the quality of life is, is, impaired, is worsened. And as a result, our self-management's impaired. Very consistent theme here. And the potential for complications and, and reduced life expectancy is higher than it would be from someone with diabetes alone. Right. So this is really, truly the impact of, of mental health on many of these disease states. And, and I want to throw in there, uh, you know, as we kind of begin to transition to hope, yeah. diabetes is reversible in many people, type two diabetes. Um, and that's because of the way we've talked about this on the show before, uh, fat blocks up the insulin receptor. So if you can reverse the way you eat, get oils and a lot of processed foods, animal products out of your diet, that part of it won't happen. The problem with diet, with depression is if you're eating, trying to eat your way out of the depression if, or food changes your mood, right? And we've said this on the show before, anything that anything that changes your mood can be habit forming, anything, right? So if you, you know, if you're like, oh, you drive by Starbucks and you think, oh, it'd be so nice to have a whatever frappe latte and, a, and one of their sweet scones or I don't know, I don't go to Starbucks. You know, and you said, oh, that make, you, 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 your mood will start to change just while you drive in the drive through line. Mm -hmm. And when you get it and you start eating and your mood changes, you know, that that means that every time you feel down, you're going to want to turn to this thing. For the diabetic, that's dangerous because you've got to be in control of what you eat every single time. Because uh, every, you know, it, this is why we study, we, 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 we measure for hemoglobin A1C because it's not even the, your blood sugar in the moment. It's the trend of your blood sugar over weeks at a time that really causes the damage and depression. You know, one of the 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 the, the, the uh, kind of the side effects of a bad depressive state is the loss of a desire to do better. Um, or, you know, that grit we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. So, and, and and to your point, Columbus, depression is one of the. I mean, diabetes is one of the worst things you can get, and so is depression. Yeah. You bring those two things together, and you know the mind, the body, everything is out of sync. Um, and before long, it's not just diabetes you're dealing with. Now you're dealing with cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke, and then you get even more depressed. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a it's a downward spiral that we're talking about, um, and the need to really address this um, with every aspect of life. Yeah, I mean it's crazy when we start to look at this in in detail about how everything seems to be related. Right. So, I mean, just I mean, our mind and our body are connected. We can't separate one from the other. That's right. And and it's so important whether or not we're looking at mind, body, soul, our spirit, spiritual aspect, our, our physical aspect of our of our thought process of how we function. It comes together. 
And so you can't really tap into one without tapping into the other effectively to maintain this health state. And that's why, you know, I, lo I, I love the concept in this statement really about life is 10 percent what happens to you and 90 percent how you respond. Right. That's and right. I, I think Chuck Swindoll is is famously kind of attributed to this statement, but he's not the, the first to, to develop it in concept. Probably Hans Salier is the father of stress and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's I think this is this is an important one and kind of dovetails an ability for us to kind of talk a little bit more at length about the good stuff. What can and we do? I, I want to go back to that last slide, though, because I worry, honestly, I do worry a bit about um, you don't have to show it. I just I just want to say okay. about how, you know, as African-Americans a lot, you know, I, I hear um, the cry of people over, you know, the obvious injustices that do happen. Um, you know, difficult situations. And for many, you know, I have, you know, I have my advice is listen, no matter what is happening in the world, do good. No matter what is happening in the world, believe in yourself. No matter what is happening in the world, continue to push on. Because if you get to a place where you think, you know, the whole world is rigged against me and I'm not going to try and do anything, that's not very good for your mental health either. No. Um, and you have to, you have to believe, um, and this is where spirituality comes in. You've got to believe that there's a bigger, broader plan um, and that you are attached to that spiritual, whatever your spiritual background is, you're attached to something a lot bigger. Um, so, you know, I, 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 that is a really important statement because some people think, well, it's happening to me. I'm powerless. Other people say it's happening to me. I'm going to do better. I'm going to use this as fuel to do better. And, and, I, and I hope more people choose that route because that's better for your mental health. Yeah. You know, and just to add to that, I mean, from from a standpoint of purpose and thinking that do I matter in this world, which is a lot of times what happens in depression and mental health is you do matter. Mm -hmm. You are important. You are worth it. And here's Absolutely. the thing. I, I never forget that someone mentioned to me once. And I was like, oh, you know what I said doesn't really matter. They're like, well, how do you know that that smile that you gave me, the word of encouragement, that domino effect of what happens as a result of that, That's just right. one simple thing. Right. That maybe put someone on on track, the words of encouragement that now that person does something good that helps someone else. And now it's, you're passing That's it true. on without you even having the awareness that you were put in a particular place at a particular uh, time for a purpose. And so I'm a big believer that we all have a purpose on this earth. And some you may have the appearance of being the head and others may be the foot, but we all have a purpose that's there that can that can help move us in the direction we need to be in as as a society. And to your point, one additional thing is, I mean, man, we look at communities at risk, African-American communities, others. You think about people who lived 100 years ago who were suffering under completely different circumstances that all accounts were even worse, way worse. By far. Right. Who persisted. Right. Who persisted in building that res who are resilient That's right. for the next generation, for themselves, right. because they had they held on to hope. And That's I think right. we have to we have to lose. We have to hold on to hope. And it doesn't matter what your 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 shackles of mental challenges are. We can break free of them. We have to stay persistent in trying, I think, for sure. Yeah. And um, so, you know, and I, so I want to encourage people to really, you know, if you are first of all, if you're suffering from mental health problems, let your primary care physician know. And I would say one of the first lines of defense is to get into therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and we talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, yeah. um, uh, because that is a, a good place to start. If you can get a good, and I would say good um, uh, a therapist that's faith-based, meaning you know matches your spirituality. As a Christian, you know I like to have a Christian therapist um, but I, it's important that the whole person is addressed why I bring up spirituality in that, because that's a part of who you are. Well, you know, even an atheist, it's, the, the not believing in God is a part of who mm -hmm. they are. So it's a really important that you get a good therapist and begin to work through this before any medications are, or, you know, they may suggest medications, but not about that. It's about really working through things, talking through things, sometimes hearing yourself say things to someone who's trained to direct um, the conversation in a way for healing is really important. So I, I would throw that up there, number one. Um, number two, I, you know, I think we can expound and talk about nutrition a bit. We yeah. know that the, one of the things that causes depression is low serotonin levels in the um, nerve synapses um, in the brain and those pathways. 
And what we know is that what leads to that is a, a what, the, what the pre one of the precursors for serotonin or key precursor is tryptophan, an amino acid found in food. People say to eat turkey to get it, but what we found is when you eat turkey, there's too many different types of amino acid. You shoot all that insulin up, and they rush the brain and get in before the tryptophan can. Um, so having the right food to feed the precursor as a precursor to serotonin, which is then a precursor to melatonin. So a lot of people think of melatonin supplements. If you have the right whole food plant-based diet with rich complex carbohydrates and lots of phytonutrients, you're going to have the kind of food that will actually battle depression and anxiety. And I can't emphasize that enough because the food, the fast food industry gives you the Takis, the, the hot Cheetos, the cookies and cakes, they do the opposite. They're not going to help you to get the right food to your brain to try and develop and be stronger. So therapy, food, and then we'll talk about a couple other things, but I'll, I'll punt over to you for a little bit. Yeah, no, no, you're right on. You're on the roll, man. And I'm going to tell you, when you hit those processed foods, that increases the omega-6 as opposed to the omega-3. So the all these things. That's yep. right. And so what that ends up happening is the fact that they essentially kind of counteract the good stuff that you should be eating. Right. Yep. That we know is good for your mental health in terms of the omega threes. And so that's where it's powerful. You know, but one thing, too, as well, that we oftentimes talk about is really exercise is so Absolutely. powerful. So, so, so powerful that recent say just came out looking at over 100,000 individuals and showing that, listen, this should be one of the first line agents for counteracting depression. It is, more, it is as effective or more effective. Yes. Than the medications they prescribe exercises absolutely and and here's the here's the booster when you're exercising exercise outside and get that early morning sunlight that's going to help stimulate those melanocyte stimulating hormones that are there right? Yeah, right and 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 eric just spoke about really the power of melanin and and so forth excuse me of melatonin and so forth and kind of getting getting uh that transition over to serotonin this is another avenue that's there mm -hmm. and so these are simple ways that you can do it. You don't have to do it for an hour. You can do 10 minutes, just early morning. <laughs> Get that and I want people to remember that sometimes what depresses us is our, 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 you know, we think, you know, from a mental health standpoint, that the time we, you know, some people have done drugs, they've done, you know, they've heavily drank, they've, um, they've, um, you know, smoked weed, whatever, whatever, whatever. And now they're like, man, you know, I may have messed up my brain. Um, there could be depression from that. Depression itself makes you think your brain doesn't work well at times. But what we found with exercise is that it actually is one of the few ways you can actually stimulate new nerve growth in the brain that we thought was impossible at one time. Exercise is actually a way to, to, to revitalize and generate the, the mind. And there's a lot of really good info on that in the book, Spark. Yes. Um, but you, Thank so you for turning me on to that. That was yeah, a good book. A phenomenal book. And, and it, you know, the author does a good job of really pointing out to you the benefits of exercise for the brain and the brain's recovery. So you, if you want to beat depression, if you say, you know, I've been depressed my whole life and you don't exercise regularly. And I, to, to, to Columbus's point, get out into the sunlight for us, all of us this time of year, we can do it. The sunlight itself is also healing, not just the vitamin yes. D, but the way that some of the rays actually penetrate into the brain and body actually stimulates um, the mind and body to do so much better. So we want it, we can't overemphasize exercise. We talk a lot about whole food, plant-based, but in this one, exercise is one of, uh, in conjunction with that, is one of the strongest things that you can do. I want to throw in another thing around lifestyle and that's sleep. Um, yes. One of the presenters at the conference we were at did a great job with the sleep yes. presentation. When we sleep, it functions, and I forget uh, that book, I'm gonna forget the name of, because a longer title. Uh, why we sleep. Why we sleep. Um, one of the things that happens when we sleep is it actually it actually works like a therapy session. The dr when we dream, we're connecting the dots. If you get enough sleep, get enough REM time, you it's like you're going through therapy. So if you're getting and so if you're having trouble with sleep, there's a lot of things you can do. CBT actually helps. The cognitive behavioral therapy can actually help with your sleep patterns if you're not getting it. Making sure you're not you don't have sleep apnea. So you know, there's some simple cheap tests. You can actually just put oxygen on your finger and tell someone tell you if you sound like you stop breathing, you got sleep apnea. <laughs> um, if your oxygen dips low and you stop breathing. Um, so taking sleep very seriously, um, trying to go to bed. And it's hard. I mean, the playoffs are on now. I wish I was back on the West Coast. I missed the West Coast because when I was on the West Coast, 
these games ended three hours earlier. <laughs> you know, right. going to end at midnight. So if you stay up late, you messed up, you messed up for I, I messed up for like days now. So <laughs> I encourage you strongly to take sleep seriously, especially for your children. All learning, real learning yes. happens when you sleep. Yes. That's when these memories are put into long-term, easy, accessible places in the brain. So if you're dealing with depression and anxiety, sleep is one of the other things that's really important. Um, there's a lot of other therapies, everything from massage therapy, people really tout. There's a lot of things people do. Um, but we know from a very scientific standpoint that if you eat a whole food plant-based diet, get your exercise, get your sunlight, stay hydrated, lots of water, and make sure to get your sleep. You, a lot of what those medications they're giving out that are sold by the tens of millions of pills at a time, you will actually be able to help reverse and recover from mental health uh, illness. And, I, like, and I'm going to go all the way back. In the context of having a very qualified therapist that you're comfortable with yeah and 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 here's the thing right is the fact that i don't want you to leave thinking i'm wearing a scarlet letter if you've done all these things and you're still suffering that's the value of living in this current era is that we're able to still there's some people who can do everything right and still require some medication mm -hmm. there's some individuals Absolutely. but what we understand is that so many of us are not even beginning to do what's right <laughs> and we're relying solely on medications when there's so much that you can do to And so we're here to empower you, to let you know. And, and sleep really is the hidden secret sauce. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just trying to get that sleep. And it's, yeah. I'm, listen, Eric just told you, right, his the challenge during playoffs, that's mine. We all have our challenges with sleep at times. But we have to prioritize it and that's get right. back to prioritizing it because it's extremely important in terms of it. So that means that you have to kind of black out the, the lights, try and use the bedroom just solely for sleeping. Make sure it's a cool temperature. Make sure you get that early morning sunlight that's there that helps stimulate the, right. the, the uh, uh, melatonin inside your system, right? Those are some of the things that you want to do. You want to make sure you're not eating real close mm -hmm. in proximity to when you're going to bed. That will disrupt your sleep too as well. Having three or four hours in terms of digestive rest all plays a, uh, an important role as well as even liquid intake. Trying to really be intentional not to have it too close to the time you're going to bed so you're waking up to urinate. Okay. Even some small studies saying that maybe it's the speed at which you drink your liquids that may impact you. Now, some may still suffer with it. And there's mm -hmm. things if you don't have kidney dysfunction like magnesium theronate and some other aspects that could be useful um, to help kind of calm you, chamomile tea, and get mm -hmm. some rest um, around that time, which are useful. But sleep is powerful. Sleep is powerful. Okay. But yeah, man, this is a good one. This is a good one. You gave me yeah. some good, good thoughts <laughs> here uh, for today, some good reminders. There. And I think, you know, we want to wrap up with the fact that there is hope. Um, one of my favorite Bible verses is 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Uh, in a time when there's so much mental illness, um, you know, you can find a resting place in, in the divine, in God. Um, and I, I encourage people to, you know, um, if you are having these struggles, suicidal ideations. Um, we should have put up the suicide hotline number on here. Yeah. Um, reach out um, to someone. It is not worth it. I've, I've, as a physician, I've seen patients who have attempted suicide um, and after they've survived it, they, they absolutely have no idea what they were doing or why they would have wanted to do that. And part of that could be spiritual, obviously. Part of it could just be, you know, this is what they thought they wanted. Um, uh, there was a there was a documentary on people who jumped from the I think it was the Golden Gate Bridge and like 16, 17 people out of all the however many hundred jumped, survived. Almost every one of them said as soon as they let go of the bridge, the desire to to, to end their life disappeared. As soon as they let go, when they were out of control. As some for some folk, like my grandmother, say, that's 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 spiritual. That's the, that's some spirit that left you. But um, you know, I can't scientifically say that. What I can scientifically say is there are many people who, if they, you know, if they, if they had gotten help, would have moved beyond such feelings. And um, the 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 devastation that that kind of behavior leaves the families that are left to put together the pieces. The families that I know that recently had suicides in their families, I, I don't, you know, I, I, words cannot describe the, the devastation. So, yeah. I, you know, I say all of that to say there is hope. You, yeah. you know, there's hope in, in for me in Christ Jesus. There's hope, um, you know, in friends and family. 
but there is hope. Um, yes. and, and most importantly, you know, get to a therapist who can really help you through it. Um, again, I'm someone who's spiritually minded, in my opinion, is going to be better. Someone who, who just like in an AA, they talk about this higher power, someone who can connect you to something bigger than yourself, um, yes. that can reconnect you to purpose. Because there's a, that's what's been stripped from this generation is the concept of purpose. Um, you know, so pleasure becomes the only thing that matters. And if I'm not having pleasure, then what's the point of living? Mm -hmm. uh, so reconnect. Um, there's great hope, you know, and, and you don't have to live in a depressed state. There's a lot that can be done through medicine, through spirituality, to, through togetherness. Yes. Yes, yes, here, here. No, I love it. It's a perfect note. I think the hotline, I was just kind of checking mentally. I think it's 211 is one of the hotlines for mental health, which is 988, depending on where you're at. But remember that, hashtag it, whatever you have to do, um, and just be there for someone. You know, just, just extend yourself to tell someone you love them, that you care for them, that you're there for them, and mean it. Be willing to kind of Absolutely. be there and extend yourself, and that, that may save a life, and we just never know what someone's going through. Absolutely. But man. This is a, a deep Good conversation, session, yeah. important conversation that we had. Here Absolutely. Tonight. Absolutely. So, um, I hope it's blessed someone that's out there right now. And if it has blessed you, share it, like this station, send it out to those, blast it out there. And we'll be back next month. Promise. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. We'll be back next month. We got to hit that. I think June is men's health month. I can't, we can't bypass men's health, right? Men, men's yeah. health, there's other stuff. You got to get at it. Yes, we absolutely do. It's a good, it's a good month. <laughs> that's right. That's right. All right. Good to see you. Good all right. You, too. you all take care till next week, next 